Chicago, Illinois has been home to a lot more successful musicians over the years than one might immediately think. And for as much as mainstream music outlets tend to gloss over the city in favor of larger metropolitan areas like LA, New York, and London, one of the places Chicago will absolutely never go unnoticed is in the world of punk rock. And after having spawned some of the most influential punk bands of the past several decades, I'd say the city has forever earned itself a good couple of chapters in any hypothetical punk history book. But naturally, when we're talking about a city that spawned dozens upon dozens of brilliant, memorable bands, there's going to be some that catch on in a much bigger way than they ever could have imagined. And out of all those bands, there's of course going to be the select few who, for whatever reason, end up with the most rabid of cult fan bases who will live and die by nearly everything they release. While there's certainly been a pretty big number of these bands to come and go in punk rock over the years, and even a good several to come out of Chicago alone, there's one that at times even rivals punk's biggest names for the most dedicated fans, and in my opinion is probably the most influential punk band to make a name for themselves during the 2000s. How's it going, folks? My name is Jack Miller. I am the incredibly underqualified punk historian. And today, my friends, I am absolutely thrilled to be dedicating this year's October special to the first chapter in the history of one of my all-time favorite bands, Alkaline Trio. As usual, I'll be taking you all through the history of Alkaline Trio, starting off with their beginnings in the Chicago suburbs, all the way up to their current place in music today. Of course, along with a little bit of added trivia and some of my personal thoughts on them. Before we get started, though, I want to let you all know that I made a Spotify playlist of some some of my favorite Alkaline Trio songs, which also includes a number of tracks from side projects and other bands the current and past members had played with before Trio came to be. So if that's something that sounds interesting to you, you can find a link to it in the description below. I also have to give a shout out to my wonderful Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so, so much for the support. I've got some bonus content up on there, which you can also find a link to in the description, and any and all donations are hugely appreciated. And finally, if you are interested in seeing videos about punk rock, then may I humbly ask that you please subscribe to my channel here. I'm having a lot of fun making these, and I want to make sure that all of you can keep having fun watching them. But before we jump in, I want to let you all know that this video is sponsoring my band Me Grimlock's new single, The Whale. We've been working pretty hard on this track over the past month or so, and we are very, very excited that it's now officially out online as of October 16th, and it's just one click away, so if you do choose to listen to it, you have no idea how much we appreciate your support. We're also going to be doing a West Coast tour here in the next month of November, 2024, and I'll be posting a few more updates on that in the near future, but if you want more info on that as well, you can also find links to all the dates and our socials in the description below. Anyways! The story of Alkaline Trio begins at the hands of guitarist and vocalist Matt Skiba in the town of McHenry, Illinois, a smaller suburban community roughly an hour outside of downtown Chicago. And like a lot of young musicians, Matt would spend all of his free time as a teenager playing guitar and hopping in and out of various bands in his local music scene. But as I'm sure you can imagine, none of these high school endeavors found much success outside of their local all-ages clubs. So it wouldn't be until after his graduation in 1994 that Matt was able to relocate to Chicago and get his first taste of what being in a real band was like. So in the fall of 94, Matt began attending Columbia College alongside his high school friend and fellow musician Rob Doran, and thus Rob would inevitably be the first person Matt would recruit for his new band as a bass player. But a guitar and bass alone can only get you so far, and while one can only assume this probably helped the pair of them get a little bit more songwriting done, they weren't going to be playing any shows until they found themselves a drummer. Fortunately for the sake of time, Time, though, the two of them just so happened to have another old friend that also happened to be living in Chicago at the time. And although he already had a pretty tight schedule as the full-time drummer of one of Chicago punk's favorites of the era, 88 Fingers Louie, Glenn Porter must have been so pleased to see some familiar faces after his own move to Chicago that he still made time to play drums for his old friends. And the three of them very quickly bonded both socially and musically over their shared affection for staple punk bands like Jawbreaker and the 
Clash, as well as Chicago favorites like Naked Ray Gun and Screeching Weasel. Which, as you can imagine, prompted the band to develop a very raspy pop punk sound that, even in its earliest of stages, almost perfectly blended the emotional, deep lyricism of Jawbreaker with the snarly, punctual musicianship of Chicago punk, and of course, the anthemic vocal hooks and choruses one typically might think of when anyone mentions The Clash. But punk wasn't the only thing these guys had in their wheelhouse either, and at the time, Matt Skiba was very fond of the folk singer-songwriter Annie DeFranco and her darker take on what a lot of people probably think of as a pretty safe and approachable music genre. In fact, Matt was such a big fan of hers that one of the first songs the band ever learned how to play was a punk rendition of her tune Both Hands that he'd arranged. But of course, that was just the very beginning, and it didn't take the guys very much longer to write up the rest of their first show-ready set. But a band isn't playing any shows until they have a name, and while the three of them knew pretty much right from the get-go that they wanted to be this something trio, they were having a bit of trouble deciding what trio they wanted to be. So with no better option, the guys turned to the age-old method of pick up a dictionary and see what that can do for you. And it only took them a couple pages into the A's when they discovered the word alkaline and that alkaline trio had a nice ring to it. So now that they had a name, the band then of course got to work on getting themselves booked at all their favorite places to go out and see shows. And one of these places would be the now semi-famed Chicago Fireside Bowl, where the alkaline trio guys found themselves so often that they eventually got to know the staff there pretty well. One of whom was an audio engineer named Elliot Dix, who worked at the venue part-time as a sound guy. So no, at this point, since Trio had been gigging locally a pretty decent amount, they all figured it was probably time to do some recording. And naturally, Elliot was the first person they thought of to call when they needed to get that done. And the band met up with him in the early winter of 1996, laying down four pretty rough demos of tracks that would later be professionally recorded and make appearances on a few different releases. And I would say all of them have become diehard fan favorites at this point. Unlike most demos, though, this one actually can be found on streaming. And if you've ever wondered where the final four tracks on the Redux version of God Damn It came from, well, there's your answer. I've also read that Elliot was an intern to former big black guitarist Steve Albini at the time, who, if you don't know, was also a pretty accomplished producer before he passed away earlier this year, and that this demo was recorded somewhere in his house. However, I can't tell you with confidence if this is true or not, so maybe file it under possible. But going back to the main story at hand, amidst the demoing process, Ambition was at an all-time high for the young and hungry Alkaline Trio. So of course, all kinds of ideas were being kicked around. And the most noteworthy of these ideas would be a crudely drawn heart that Glenn Porter designed with the intention of being the band's logo. But as I'm sure even the most casual of Alkaline Trio fans know, that isn't the full extent of what we now know as the logo. And it would be Glenn's then-girlfriend and the band's future manager, Heather Hanora, who would make the final edit to this design by drawing a little skull at the center of the heart. So now that Alkaline Trio had found themselves a bit of identity, we're starting to see some pretty regular turnouts at their shows in Chicago, and we're finding their way around in neighboring cities every once in a while, one might be wise to assume it was probably time to get some more professional recordings done. And this would happen in January of 1997, roughly a month or so after the band had finished their demo. And they would be approached by Johan's Face Records owner Mark Ruvalo, who offered to put out their first release and introduce them to a local audio engineer named Matt Allison. So Trio would presumably sign some kind of agreement and met up with Matt at Atlas Studios in Chicago and laid down a couple of tracks by the names of Sundials and Nose Over Tail. And after a bit of mixing and mastering, the pair of songs then made their first appearance in mid-1997, releasing in the form of a 7-inch which shared a title with the first track Sundials and featured three devil characters on its artwork designed by then-bassist Rob Doran. And to an extent, these little devil guys have become pretty iconic to most diehard Alkaline Trio fans, but certainly haven't gotten the same kind of attention that the Heart and Skull design has. I also want to make note of an additional track that came out somewhere in the mix of all this called 97 and first appeared on a compilation put out by Johan's Face titled Mark's a Dick and Gar's a Drunk in December of 1996. According to the original Sin documentary, the first recording sessions with Matt Allison took place in January of 1997. So presumably, since this track was released a whole month prior, I'd be willing to bet it was recorded somewhere else. Where and with who, I have absolutely no idea. But what I can tell you is that for as obscure of a track this originally was, it too has become a bit of a diehard fan favorite. And part of the reason I wanted to make note of it so much is because it's 
actually one of my favorite Alkaline Trio songs. But now that they were on a real label and putting out music in a more official manner, the band was starting to become a lot more serious of an endeavor. And as their show schedule started to become more and more demanding, bassist Rob Doran came to the realization that the working band life wasn't really for him. And towards the end of 1997, he would resign from Alkaline Trio and return to his schooling. But even with a founding member of the band now out of the picture, Matt and Glenn were still driven as ever to see how far Alkaline Trio could go. And it wouldn't be long until the two of them would cross paths with a much more seasoned bass player by the name of Dan Andriano. Now, the guys had actually met Dan a number of times before through previous musical endeavors of theirs that just so happened to share the stage with his other band, Slapstick and Tuesday. And although Dan was still a member of Tuesday when he joined Alkaline Trio, their schedule had become relaxed enough for him to focus on another band. So with that extra time on his side, Dan promptly got to work on not just getting himself up to speed with the material Matt and Glenn had already written with Rob, but truly imprinting his own take on Alkaline Trio, even if at the time it was just revamping the bass parts. But being the skilled songwriter he was, it wouldn't take Dan very long to find his place as a co-writer of sorts with Matt. And I, for one, don't think the band would be anything like it is now, or has been for the past 20 years without that. And they probably wouldn't have seen anywhere near the amount of success they have either. Fortunately, things worked out the way they did here, though, and with Dan's bass playing, singing, and writing now fully incorporated, the new and improved Alkaline Trio started touring full-time come the beginning of 1998. And with his contacts at Asian Man Records through Slapstick and Tuesday, Dan was also able to help get the label owner Mike Park to squeeze Trio into their roster after Matt sent him a copy of the band's 7-inch and demo tape. And being the ethical man that he is, Mike Park would sign Alkaline Trio over a simple handshake agreement. And once that was taken care of, the band pretty much immediately hit the studio again at Atlas with Matt Allison in what I would assume would have been one of the early months of 1998. Pumping out four brand new tracks for their debut release with Asian Man that made its first appearance on May 26th of 1998 under the title For Your Lungs Only. But even though that EP was certainly a promising impression from Alkaline Trio, it was still just the very beginning. And come the summer of 1998, the band would return to Atlas Studios to begin work on their first full-length record. Though producer Matt Allison was already very impressed with what he'd seen Trio do in the studio so far, I think it's pretty safe to say it was the making of this record that solidified him as not only a forever fan, but also their go-to producer for many years to come. As the band totally blazed through the first run of recording track after track and did the vast majority of the instrumental parts live in a couple of takes. And though Alkaline Trio being able to execute this so well was of course extremely impressive, and especially when considering Dan Andriano had barely been a member of the band for even a year at this point, the main reason for the rush was actually because the recording sessions took place right before he was supposed to head out of town on tour with Tuesday. Though they were of course able to finish everything before he headed out of state, unfortunately Dan would have to record all of his vocal parts before Matt could get the chance to record any of his. And by all of his vocal parts, I mean the backups and harmonies too. And as you might have noticed upon one or two of your listens to this album, there's a couple of spots where Dan's backup vocals feel the slightest bit offset with Matt's leads. And while I would say this very much adds to this album's charm, what a lot of us, including myself, probably thought of as a stylistic decision is actually an error that came about due to this time constraint. The most obvious example of this that sticks out in my mind is on the track My Little Needle, where Matt and Dan both sing the line, like my guts have dried up and died at a completely different pace, but there's definitely more than a few examples of this on the album. But regardless of how it came about, like I said earlier, this is one of many little quirks this record has that very much work in its favor. And even this early on, I think it's pretty evident that Alkaline Trio were destined for bigger and better things. For one, this was a pretty fresh take on pop punk at the time, ditching the juvenile sense of humor and lighthearted tone of bands like Blink-182 and the Ataris for something a lot darker and more personal. And I would also say the very grungy, warm-feeling production is something Trio would set a trend with in pop punk, and especially so for its more underground varieties. And on that note, I would say this record really shines with its instrumentals too, and I think that's also where it stands in direct contrast to so many of its contemporaries the most, as it's completely absent of any jangly lead riffs and simple power chord rhythms, and instead utilizes this very open, chordy, and almost noisy guitar playing that leaves the main melody solely in the hands of the vocals. And considering the sharp contrast the lyrical tone offers as well, I'd say that helped this record stand out all that much more. But if you know your punk history, then you might be aware that this is very much a nod to bands of the early 90s, like Jawbreaker, Sam I Am, and 15 that incorporated a similar writing style, but I would be one to argue that Alkaline Trio was really the band to polish off what they'd started. I could probably gush over every little detail about this record for the entire length of this video, and you best believe I have already done so on Patreon, so I probably should just leave it at that. 
But the bottom line is, Trio already had developed their own breed of pop punk before their first full-length record had even made its debut. And when it did make its debut, it was an utter smash hit in the underground, releasing on October 13th of 1998 through Asian Man Records under the name God Damn It. A title the band had picked in part due to Matt Skiba's avid interest in Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan at the time, and the album artwork featured three alarm clocks all set to 6am to further complement this theme of Satanism. But of course, this also worked just as well as a bit of a joke on the feeling one experiences after waking up to an early morning alarm. And this is a perfect example of a very organically alkaline trio personality that I guess you could call evil with a sense of humor, which very quickly became something the band continued to develop and build on over the many years to come. For the sake of trivia, I thought I'd also throw in that the now iconic font the band chose to use for their name was taken from an old sign at the public library in Glenn Porter's hometown of Crystal Lake, Illinois. But going back to the main timeline here, once God Damn It was officially out, Alkaline Trio hit the U.S. touring circuit pretty hard, and now with the backing and connections they had from Asian Man Records, they were able to get themselves onto some pretty killer shows. And the first of these would be a supporting slot for Blake Schwarzenbach from Jawbreaker's new band at the time, Jets to Brazil, at the Fireside Bowl in Chicago. And at the show, the trio guys would proudly announce it was their album release show, as technically it was, but completely oblivious to the fact that it was also Jets to Brazil's album release show for their 1998 record, Orange Rhyming Dictionary. Well, in the grand scheme of things, I can't imagine this was all that big a deal as far as any of the musicians or fans present were concerned. It might have been a little embarrassing for the trio guys at the time, considering they were all huge Jawbreaker fans and hoping to leave a good impression on Jets to Brazil. But any minor inconveniences that might have come about at the beginning of their post-release show schedule were quickly brushed aside as Alkaline Trio found themselves on bill after bill with the St. Louis ska punk quintet MU330, which gave the band their first real exposure to playing to decently sized crowds every night. And though Dan and Glenn had presumably already experienced this quite a bit through their endeavors with Slapstick and 88 Fingers Louie, respectively, I'm sure they were just as jazzed as Matt must have been to be seeing their new band accomplish similar goals. So, after a number of well-received shows supporting MU330, Alkaline Trio rode their momentum back into Atlas Studios come March of 1999 and recorded four more brand new tracks with their new favorite producer, Matt Allison. And these tunes would make their first appearance several months later in July of 1999 on an EP called I Lied My Face Off, which shared a name with the final track. The band would also shoot their first music video for the EP's opener, Goodbye Forever, albeit a relatively silly and pretty obviously homemade one, but it still holds the title of the first ever Alkaline Trio music video and a pretty fun piece of their history and landmark of how far they've come. According to the not-so-reliable source of the YouTube comments section, I remember reading at one point that, allegedly, Matt Skiba was on mushrooms for the video shoot, including the shots where he's driving a vehicle, apparently. I have no way of confirming whether this is fact or fiction, but either way, I think it's pretty funny, so I just thought I'd share it as another little tidbit of trivia. And the new EP proved to further solidify Alkaline Trio as one of the up-and-coming bands of the day to pay attention to. And following its release, they would not only hit the road again with MU330, but would also score themselves a series of short tours and one-off shows with bands outside of the Asian Man Records roster that they were a little bit better suited for musically, as at the time, Asian Man was largely a third-wave ska label. And as they grew more and more popular in the underground touring circuit, Trio would simultaneously catch on in both the punk and emo scenes pretty fast, winning over crowds wherever they went as they supported Face to Face, Kid Dynamite, Braid, and several other noteworthy bands before the year was over. But as 1999 drifted closer and closer to its end, the Alkaline Trio guys found themselves with another dozen or so new songs and a whole heap of ambition to get back into the studio. So in October of that year, the band called up their old friend Matt Allison and headed on down to Atlas Studios for another series of sessions, laying down 10 brand new tracks that I would say perfectly pick up from where God damn it left off. Now, when I was talking about that record earlier, remember how I mentioned the chordy, fuzzier guitar playing that gave the vocals a chance to fully step into the limelight? Well, with a bit more writing experience on the band's part and some more familiarity with the band's vibe on Matt Allison's end, I think the lot of them were able to make this one of the most definitive appeals of Alkaline Trio's music with this second full-length record. Also, another characteristic of Alkaline Trio that I think works in their favor, and probably more than anything else, is their ability to make the listener experience and visualize their emotions through lyrics and vocal deliveries. And while I certainly would say this is something present on God Damn It, I think it shines through a lot more on this album. And no track highlights this better than the nearly 25-year running fan favorite and show closer Radio, which also, coincidentally enough, closes off the record's track listing. And while this song maybe didn't showcase the same kind of broader mainstream potential that early underground hits from bands like Blink-182, Sum 41, or Fall Out Boy might have broadcasted to the world, what it 
did demonstrate potential for was the type of cult fan base worship that so many punk bands of the 90s generation had. In other words, Alkaline Trio had far too many jagged edges to appeal to a full-on mainstream crowd the way a band like Blink-182 could, and they definitely weren't a band for everyone. But they were the type of band that the people who did connect with them were going to do so on a much deeper level, to the point where they might even do something like get their logo or lyrics tattooed on them, or spend a few hundred dollars on an original pressing of the Sundial 7-inch. You know, kind of like the types of rabid fans the likes of No Effects, Rancid, and Pennywise tended to attract. But of course, by the year 2000, the mainstream music industry had had its fill of trying to refine the edges of California skate punk for a family-friendly crowd. That is, if they could even get one of those bands to sign a contract in the first place. So of course, Algaline Trio weren't gonna wake up to a bunch of voicemails from Warner Brothers representatives absolutely gushing about how much radio had moved them. And I think everybody in the band was well aware that their take on pop punk was not a mainstream friendly one. However, much like their skate punk predecessors, I think the fact that their music was written for the underground audience instead of deliberately trying to dumb things down for the mainstream is something that's helped it age and stand the test of time a lot better than others who may have had some more popular singles back in the day but are nowhere near the legacy level of Trio now. But anyways, the record will make its debut on March 14th of 2000 under the title Maybe I'll Catch Fire. And as I'm sure you can imagine, it was met with a very, very favorable response from fans. Along with that, the band would also issue a split with their label mates the Blue Meanies a little later on into the year, for which Trio would put together a punk rendition of the Cars song Bye Bye Love. And this is actually a pretty obscure release, and I didn't even know it or that cover existed before writing this video because it's the only place that either of its tracks have ever been released. But although things were looking pretty promising for Trio on the musical front, personnel-wise it was a bit of a different story. As founding drummer Glenn Porter would part ways with the band shortly after the full length came out in the winter of 2000. But with the reputation and connections they already had managed to score in their first four years with Glenn, Alkaline trio were able to find a replacement drummer pretty quick, and they would bring in longtime smoking Pope's drummer Mike Fellumley to fill the role long term. And if you're an Alkaline Trio fan and you haven't heard the smoking Popes yet, I would highly recommend you check them out as soon as you possibly can. The band would then embark on a series of more serious touring endeavors pretty much right after they'd gotten Mike up to speed. The first of which would be Asian Man Records' Plea for Peace tour throughout June and July that they followed up with a series of dates in support of Face to Face and Newfound Glory in the fall. Trio would also carry out their first handful of tours with Gainesville, Florida's Hot Water Music around this time, a band that I'm sure a lot of us probably know would only continue to share the stage and collaborate with Alkaline Trio throughout the 2000s and 2010s. But I would say the most important part of the timeline to mention here is the band's very, very wise decision to reissue all of their previous B-side recordings on a self-titled compilation. Though this certainly isn't an uncommon practice as bands get bigger, and especially when it comes to punk rock, it usually is something that happens a lot further on into their run. And a good example of that might be Rancid's B-side comp from 2007, which included over 12 years worth of songs. But I would be inclined to guess that the trio guys were probably getting the impression of how dedicated their fan base had already become. And thus, this was an easy way to A, give those people exactly what they wanted by making all these songs much easier to find and listen to, and pretty much guarantee themselves a very large number of lifelong fans, and B, essentially put out a second record in the year 2000 that they knew a lot of their fans we're gonna buy without having to endure the time and expenses of writing and going back into the studio. And this comp would make its debut on April 18th of 2000 and included everything featured on the first three EPs I mentioned earlier, and of course that 97 track from the Johans Face comp, along with another song by the name of My Friend Peter, which made its first appearance earlier on that year via Thick Records Magnetic Curses compilation. The first pressing of the B-side comp would also include a cover of the Cure song Exploding Boy that the band recorded back in 1999 for a another comp called Pocket Bomb, which was issued through Law of Inertia Records. However, due to what I can only imagine were copyright issues, this would be the only version of this release to include the cover. So if you're wondering why the streaming versions or any physical copy you may own don't include this track, well, that's because it was only released on it this one time. But as I'm sure you can imagine, the reissue comp was far from the only iron Alkaline Trio had in the fire at the time. And as the 21st century entered its second year, the band would score themselves a record deal with the then up-and-coming Vagrant Records a subsidy of the much larger BMG and Universal that had a bit more reach than a purely indie like Asian Man and could help them take things a little bit further. Once the deal was all sealed on the label end, Trio then promptly got to work on recording a brand new LP with Matt Allison. However, this time using some of the extra cash they'd found themselves with, the band chose to do the recording at the more reputable Pachyderm Studios in Cannon Falls, Minnesota. And if that wasn't enough already, Alkaline Trio also decided to bring in the famed punk producer Jerry Finn to handle the mixing duties, which I would say 
easily resulted in their best sounding album up until this point. And so, after the band laid down 14 brand new tracks at Pachyderm during the latter months of 2000, Matt Allison shipped them off to Jerry Finn at Engine Studios in Chicago for mixing and mastering. But instead of just releasing the album right away, Trio decided to build up a little extra hype. Releasing the song Stupid Kid as a single on March 25th of 2001, roughly a month before the record's debut. The band would also shoot an incredibly dark but also very charming music video for this track, which features a little devil child attending private school and, of course, finding a way to kill everyone by the end of the video. And this clip would actually see a really decent amount of airplay on MTV and other outlets of the era, and from what I understand was also Alkaline Trio's first ever pro shot video, so I can only imagine it helped hype up the record that much more. Another video for the following single, Private Eye, would also appear a number of months after the record came out, but given its later release date and more simple nature as a straightforward performance video, this one is not nearly as famous as the clip for Stupid Kid. But speaking of that record release date, the album would make its debut on April 3rd of 2001 under the name From Here to Infirmary, showcasing 12 of the 14 new songs the band recorded at Pachyderm, with the two remaining B-sides being reserved for exclusive bonus tracks on the UK release. These songs went by the names Hell Yes and My Standard Break from Life, and would be made available to the rest of the world a little later on into 2001, via a two-song EP that was interestingly enough issued through the cult favorite Lookout Records, a label that you may or may not be familiar with for putting out staple releases from countless other noteworthy punk bands including Operation Ivy, The Groovy Ghoulies, Rancid, and Green Day. And this new record proved to be yet another smash hit for Alkaline Trio, easily their biggest one by this point in their career. And with an album that successful, the band naturally found themselves with some pretty game-changing touring opportunities as well. And this included a series of short tours in the U.S. with other staple names of the era including the Get Up Kids, Hot Water Music, and Saves the Day, select appearances at Warp Tour over the summer, and the band's first trip to Europe and the UK in the fall and winter. But the biggest live events for Alkaline Trio this year would be their supporting slot on the 2001 Honda Civic Tour with Blink-182, giving them a chance to probably play for the biggest crowds they'd ever had up until this point. Midway through Alkaline Trio's summer touring endeavors, though, Mike Fellomley would choose to part ways with the band over, allegedly, some internal disagreements regarding their schedule. On one hand, Matt and Dan were thrilled with the progress and momentum their band had already drummed up and wanted to ensure that it kept growing in every way possible. But Mike, on the other hand, being the only member of the band with children at the time, wanted some more time to spend with his family during the fall months of each year. While this was, of course, a completely understandable thing for someone in his position to want, it would mean Alkaline Trio would have to cut down their touring schedule quite a bit. So I, for one, would be inclined to assume that the arguments the three of them probably had around this issue led Mike to voluntarily leave the band in the summer of 2001. But this, of course, left Alkaline Trio with an entirely different problem, one that was not only bringing in a new drummer, but finding someone who is both capable and willing to learn over four albums worth of material in what I can only assume wasn't much longer than a couple of weeks. But just like they had time and time again over the course of the past three and a half years, Matt and Dan struck gold once more, teaming up with former Suicide Machines drummer Derek Grant come mid-July of 2001, who would fill the role for the remainder of Trio's tour schedule, and as I'm sure many of you probably know, a very, very long time after that as well. But as the summer and fall of 2001 came to a close, the Trio guys would find themselves with a little more free time. And with Derek now more or less fully adjusted into his role as their new drummer, the three of them figured it was the perfect time to hop into the studio and debut his playing on record. Now, remember earlier when I mentioned the band had developed a friendship with the Florida punk quartet Hot Water Music through a series of tours back in 1999 and 2000? Well, the pair of bands would get the green light from Wilmington, Delaware's Jade Tree Records to put out a split EP together towards the end of 2001. Trio would enter the studio with Matt Allison again, this time at Semaphore Studios in Chicago, and recorded two brand new tracks by the names of While You're Waiting and Queen of Pain, along with a cover of Hot Water's song Rooftops from their 1999 full-length No Division. Hot Water Music would also contribute a couple songs of their own by the names of God Waiting and Russian Roulette, along with their take on Alkaline Trio's now signature track Radio, which I for one found to be a pretty solid cover, along with an acoustic rendition of the song Bleeder from the I Lied My Face Off 7-inch. And the split would make its debut on January 22nd of 2002 via Jade Tree Records, and quickly garnered itself a warm reception from critics and both fan bases alike, and now sits at what I would argue is one of both bands' more popular B-side releases. But Hot Water Music wouldn't be the only band Trio would cover in 2002, and a little later on into the year, the band would also issue a two-song 7-inch of Misfits covers, the first of which was the widely beloved Halloween track, and the second a deeper cut by the name of Children in Heat. And although 
Although this release wouldn't reach quite as far as the Hot Water Music split and has actually become pretty obscure in recent years, likely as a result of copyright issues, it still proved to be moderately successful amongst fans upon its release, and also proved to be another great guinea pig to dial things in with Derek in the studio. Well, I'm sure many of us know this is just the beginning for what most fans probably consider to be the next era of Alkaline Trio as they crept further out of the underground and a little more into the limelight, it is going to be the end of the timeline for this video. And while we of course can't discuss the full legacy of Alkaline Trio at this point in the story, I still think it's important to shed some light on the very impressive cult favorite success they'd already achieved in less than half a decade. Generally speaking, I'd say it typically takes a band at least five or six years of putting out records on a mid-tier level to develop any kind of cult status, but Alkaline Trio was pretty much already there, if not well on the way, by the time their second full-length came out. And for as atypical of a pop-punk writing style as they had back in the day, I gotta say, I think that's the thing that did them the most favors in this context. Like I mentioned earlier, Trio came out right at the dawn of the early 2000s pop-punk stuff's time in the spotlight. Bands like Blink-182 and Sum 41 were about to take over the world, and bands all over were trying their damnedest to sound exactly like them, in hopes that some record label would want to pick them up and make them the next big thing. And don't get me wrong, this certainly worked for a handful of bands that genuinely were that band, if you will. And not only that, but also had plenty of their own quirks and original ideas they brought to the table, along with just naturally being being a very fun, lighthearted pop punk band that could appeal to more than just an underground crowd. But for every Fallout Boy or Newfound Glory, there's 10 or even 15 more bands who are trying to do more or less the same thing, but just didn't have enough personality to break through. But Alkaline Trio, on the other hand, weren't even trying to emulate a tried and true method with their own spin on it, and instead opted to concoct a pop punk formula of their own that, well, maybe didn't speak to a mainstream radio listening crowd, punk fans absolutely adored because of its originality. And even before the early 2000s, were over, I think we started to see just how impactful Alkaline Trio's music had already become, as more and more pop-punk bands around the world donned a similarly dark and fuzzier feel to their music. In addition to that, by the time Alkaline Trio were getting their music videos played on MTV and touring with Blink-182 in 2001, I would say they'd done a phenomenal job of putting the Chicago punk scene on the map a little more, and set the city up for becoming one of, if not the, US punk epicenter for pretty much the previous 25 years and counting. And while they certainly weren't the first punk punk band with a reputation to come out of Chicago, I still think their success did a lot more than anyone before them when it came to further laying down the groundwork that helped other bands reach their full potential. And quite honestly, I think they also helped shed a fair amount of light on some older Chicago bands too. Most obviously by sharing members with Slapstick and 88 Fingers Louie, but also giving various nods to countless more bands throughout their career. And sure, this might be a little bit of a stretch, and while a lot of people think of Rise Against as this band, as they were able to take things quite a bit further with a similar formula, I still honestly don't think they would have gotten that far if Trio hadn't come along first. It's kind of a tale as old as time with music. One artist comes along and does something pretty cool, then another takes it from there and pushes it further, and then someone else follows in their footsteps and manages to take it way further than anyone before them could have predicted. In this case, Alkaline Trio maybe sits as the middle child, while a band like Screeching Weasel can act as the first prototype. But something true about all three of these bands is that they all have a much colder, very authentically Chicago Chicago take on pop punk. Screeching Weasel was just a little too rough around the edges to break out of the underground, and Rise Against just happened to be at the right place at the right time. But while usually things that fall in the middle child category tend to be reaping the burdens of such a situation, in a musical context, and specifically one involving an underground cult fan base like punk, it tends to be a much more respectable position in the eyes of most fans. For one, Alkaline Trio have never been a band that gets a ton of hate for quote selling out the way Rise Against has for the past 15 years or so. And even when they have pushed the more pop side of their songwriting, they were met with a lot more praise than any punk band bigger than them would have been. And then on the flip side, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find somebody in the punk scene who hasn't at least heard radio, even if they wouldn't consider themselves a trio fan. And while Screeching Weasel certainly have a cult fan base of their own, they're very much the type of band you're a lot more likely to run into someone who's heard their name before, but have never actually listened to their music. But as we all know, Alkaline Trio were still on their way up to that at this point, but certainly getting closer and closer with each and every step they took. And the band we're about to find out the success from here to Infirmary had gotten was merely the beginning of their journey to becoming one of Punk's most widely loved cult favorites. But sadly, that will have to wait until our next installment in our series on Alkaline Trio. But I will say I have genuinely loved writing and researching for this one, and I cannot wait to be revisiting this story with the next installment. But that's enough for me. I want to hear what you guys have to say. What's your favorite release from this era of Alkaline Trio? Do you have any favorite songs? Which drummer of theirs do you consider to be your favorite.
favorite? Let me know in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.